What's going on everybody? Justin here at Salt Strong back in the real room again and this is going to be a good video. Today we're going to talk about from each major manufacturer from Shimano, Penn, and Daiwa in that sweet $200 category that a lot of people look at. That tends to be when you think of performance, that best bang for buck value. In the $200 category, what do each of these reels offer to you as an inshore angler? I think brass tacks right up front, all of these reels are excellent. The Shimano, the, Di the Daiwa, the Pen, they're all great reels. They're all gonna catch fish. They're all gonna last a long time. But I think some do certain things better than others. And this is gonna be a little bit of a deep dive, kind of looking at the features that each of these reels offer. We're gonna talk about main gear material. We're gonna talk about sealing overall because they all feel and perform a little bit differently in that category. All the juicy stuff that people really wanna know about these reels we're gonna to address today in this video. And before we go into this detailed video, we're gonna do a quick screen share. We're gonna go over all the specs, cross and compare all three of these reels. Alrighty, keeping things really brief here, this screen share is just gonna be an overview of the specs that each of these three reels offer in this comparison video. So we're gonna be taking a look at the Shimano Stratic FL 3000, the Penn Spin Fisher 6 2500, and the Daiwa BGMQ 3000. And just a couple things to note, we're not gonna dive into the specs per se in this section, but some things to point out, yes, I did intentionally want to compare two 3000 size reels against a 2500 size reel because I want this to be the most fair comparison for all aspects considered. Looking at gear ratio, weight, line capacity, and max drag, I intentionally went with the Stratic FL 3000 because it is very similar in size to its 2500 counterpart. It has a deeper spool for more line capacity and it has the carbon fiber drag stack upgrade when you get to the 3000 and higher. And as for the BGMQ 3000, kind of the same reason. Uh, the 3000 is very similar to the 2500 in size, has more line capacity, and it has the higher gear ratio. So it's gonna have competitive inches per turn when you compare it to the other two reels we're looking at. And the Penn Spin Fisher 2500 is the smallest and lightest size. I knew that weight was gonna be a considerable thing when trying to compare these three reels, but this is intended to be a very fair comparison. So I thought these three would be the most considerate uh, when you look at them side by side. So a couple really quick things to note in the bearings section, you always notice that manufacturers put plus one and a lot of people think that means plus one bearing in the line roller assembly. I don't know if that's entirely true guys, because what we're going to talk about later on the BGMQ is that it's a bushing. I'm going to go into that in more detail, but uh, I thought that was interesting that Daiwa still puts that there. Please correct me in the comments section if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there is a bearing here at the line roller assembly of that reel. And maybe that plus one could mean that a bearing is in someplace different that we might not realize. So that's something I always find interesting when I see that in a uh, spec sheets from different manufacturers. Also, one other important thing is talking about gear ratio. All three of these reels have at least a 6.2 to 1 gear ratio but really at the end of the day I don't think that's what fishermen or at least inshore fishermen are looking for they're wanting to know how fast is the reel or how many inches per turn are each of these reels picking up per full turn of the handle and you'll see that the Stratic and the BGMQ pretty fast 36 37 inches per turn but just because that number is 6.2 doesn't mean that that's everything that you want to look for because take for example the regular Daiwa BG has a lower number uh, gear ratio 5.2 to 1 I believe but it still brings in 34 or 35 inches per turn it still brings in a lot of line so this really isn't the determining factor I think of what people are looking for they're looking for that inches per turn aspect and then finally for line capacity and max drag, every reel is gonna hold at least 200 yards of 10 pound with the BGMQ having the highest. And every reel is gonna put out, you know, about 20 pounds of drag. The Spin Fisher shows 15 pounds. The BGMQ is a massive 22 pounds of drag, which is crazy. But at the end of the day, I think most fishermen are probably not gonna need more than 10 or maybe 12 at the very most. And that is still a ton of drag, guys. So these are all just reference points to look at as you're trying to make an educated buying decision. And then now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the features and components packed into these three reels. As we go deeper into talking about these reels, we're going to kind of approach things from a category or, or a certain topic of things that intra fishermen are looking for in reels. To start, we're going to talk about level of sealing. Now, sealing and then later on smoothness or refinement, they're two mutually exclusive things. As a general whole, it can be very difficult to have a reel that is both very smooth 
and extremely well sealed. And I think that's what people want. They want that balance of the two, but we're gonna start this conversation and take a look at a level of sealing. And I think when people think about sealing and they look at all three of these options, instinctually, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna to wanna to look at the pen for that category. So what pen does in their Spin Fisher 6 and higher is they incorporate IPX ratings. I believe the, the Spin Fisher 6 incorporates an IPX5 rating. It's not listed here. But IPX ratings or IP ratings is uh, ingress protection, okay? That is a matter of how well do solids or physical contaminants and how well does water make its way into the object that we're testing. So IPX really is noting that IP ratings are kind of in two numerical values. You have IP and then you have a number and a number. The first number means a solid. How well do solids make their way into the body? The second number scale, I think up to like an eight or a nine is how well does, how well protected is this item to liquid? In the case of reels, it's IPX because solids are, are kind of negligible. Like solids are not getting into spinning reels to begin with. We're, they're already well sealed to the point where salt and you know physical contaminants have a hard time getting in. So it's not much of a factor when it comes to this particular rating. The IPX5 rating is very specific. This particular item right here needs to be blasted with water at a certain amount. I think it's 12 liters per minute and it needs to be nine feet away and blasted for a period of at least three minutes. Under those qualifications, under those specs, they'll then tear down the reel, take the top spool off, and, and determine how much water made its way into the gearbox and into the drag stack up top. And they've confirmed that this passes an IPX5 rating at the bare minimum. Generally, I think that's significant. Uh, you think about it, how many people are gonna blast for an extended period of time a reel with fresh water, not salt water, and it determined that water didn't really make its way into the gearbox and into the top of the drag stack. I think that it's great that Penn, that Penn did that. I think that it might be a bit overkill, in my opinion. As saltwater anglers, the things that we're gonna experience, at least here in the Southeast, from Texas up to Virginia, you're fishing for redfish, trout, and snook. Whether you're a wade fisherman, or you're fishing from a boat or a kayak, you're gonna take the occasional spray, splash. You're gonna do a light freshwater rinse to maintain your reels. Those are, those are the normal things that these reels are gonna encounter in a day. I think it's more than this reel needs, and from a ceiling standpoint, it's great. But again, kind of the sacrifice that Penn is making from a ceiling and refinement category is you have exceptional amount of ceiling, but you can kind of notice that handle slows down over time after you turn it. This is a brand new reel in the box. This is because there is a significant amount of grease packed into this reel at the handle entry point, inside the gearbox. There's a lot of physical seals and they're kind of trading off that level of sealing and refinement. There, there's a balance between the two. It's not gonna be nearly as refined and feeling for throwing small, light, artificial lures as the Shimano in Daiwa. So this is really important to keep in mind with Penn. Great, well-sealed reel. It can take some splashes. It can, it's gonna last a while and it's easy to get internal and maintain. If you wanna take the gearbox apart and you're the type of angler to wanna service your own reels, you know, change out bearings, oil things, whatnot, this is a serviceable product, which is important to some fishermen. Um, but I'd, I'd argue that the majority of the inshore community down here in the Southeast, probably want to know that their reel is going to keep on ticking and that they don't need to do a whole lot of maintenance to it. So those are all the main factors here of the pen. Well-sealed product might not be as refined compared to the other reels on the table. Now, when it comes to the other two brands, Shimano and Daiwa, in this caliber here, they really don't incorporate IPX rating. It's not an IPX 5 or 6 or 7. These manufacturers didn't go through the route of doing an IPX rating for this caliber of reel. BJMQ at 200, Stratic at about 220. There isn't IPX rating on these particular reels. If they were to have it, mm, four, five, I mean, in that same general category, I do think that the, the pen probably would outperform. It's just my personal thoughts based on the level of physical sealing applied to these two reels, but it's not a standardization. Not every manufacturer is using an IPX rating to determine the level of sealing. It's just the route that Penn went. So now we're gonna kind of talk about the very subjective approach of smoothness in a spinning reel. So I say subjective because each fisherman that picks up these reels based on their style of fishing is gonna determine a level of smoothness differently. Smoothness kind of also meaning refinement, meaning when you go to turn the handle in a reel, how much effort is required to be able to get that handle to turn around and to get your rotor 
to spin. Whether it's free spinning or with a light lure or whether it's under a load, all of these factors are something to consider when it comes to smoothness of a reel. And arguably, the Shimano and the Daiwa are both incredibly smooth products. When you turn the handle with very little resistance, both of these reels are going to spin. They're going to feel very buttery. And this feeling right here is going to last a long time between both products. So when it comes to a matter of smoothness in a reel, the bigger question is, how long is it going to stay smooth? And what was done to these reels to help make sure that it's smooth, but they're not completely making this a wide open reel? Is there still sealing on these reels? Is it as well protected as the pen from a sealing standpoint that we talked about? Did they forego all that sealing to have smoothness? And that's where things get really interesting. So both the Daiwa and the Shimano have a moderate amount of sealing. And the way that each company goes about sealing their reels is very different. I kind of want to start here with the Daiwa and then we'll take a look at the Shimano. For the MQ series of reels, the BGMQ at $200, personally, I do think this is an exceptional value. It's a compact aluminum body, very small, relatively lightweight for it being aluminum. And I have several of these in my personal arsenal right, right now. I've had no modification to this reel whatsoever. It's caught, you know, upwards of 50 fish over the past couple of months, and it's still incredibly smooth. But Daiwa's approach to sealing is different than Shimano's. The things that people want to take into consideration on sealing for a reel are how is the main gearbox contained from a sealing standpoint? How is the drag sealed? How is underneath the spool itself sealed from top to bottom? And how is the handle entry point sealed? Those are all the main areas that water is going to make its way inside of a reel. And Shimano and Daiwa are a little similar in how they do perimeter seals. They do it a little bit differently. We're going to dive into that. The handle entry point, for example, on the BGMQ, their means of sealing is this physical preliminary seal on the outside of of the body. This is a lipped ring, and the way this handle meets up, this is a female uh, little cup link right here, and this locks into this male threaded bolt that is basically a part of the main gear itself. This is an extension of the main gear. This is going to drive directly onto the main gear, and when that's on there tight, the only way for water to really get in and over is it would have to pass over top of this lip and down into the reel itself. So when this handle is put on tight, Water has to creep by, has to make its way up over around that rubber lip and then down straight into the main gear. It's already very difficult. I mean, unless you were constantly rotating this reel and spraying it from all different directions, it's going to be difficult for water to make its way in. And when it comes to the top down, all these reels in this category, when it comes to the drag cap, they're going to have a little rubber lipped seal up top to help make sure water's not getting its way and really more so physical contaminants down this rubber lift and into the drag stack. Underneath here, you're gonna notice something very important, and that's this little light rubber lip seal that we've talked about many times. What makes this unique is that there is a good amount of grease, you can kinda of see it oozing out of there, that, that serves as a good deterrent to prevent water and contaminants from making its way down, but it's not inhibiting the fluidity and smoothness of that drivetrain when this main shaft goes up and down through the rotor. So it's accomplishing two things. It's accomplishing the ceiling that we're looking for, but it's not taking away from the smoothness of the reel. So the same kind of applies to the Shimano, okay? Their way of approaching it is very similar. Again, very, very smooth, but good level of sealing. So when we take off this handle entry here, you know, they have their male threaded end here on their handle that meets into the main gear where it's got a female receiving end. And it's kind of hard to notice, but you see a little plunger in there. Once this cranks down tight, that plunger itself is what is preventing water from getting down into the main gear. I actually really like this design. I think they did a good job in regards to that handle entry point. In terms of the body itself, and forgive me, I am backtracking a little bit, the body are well sealed between both reels. You can kind of see these are very similar in size. Daiwa's approach is their MQ or monocoque frame, which is a singular one-piece body. 
really the only way in and out is that threaded side plate right here. It's got a lot of Loctite down here, pretty much holding that threaded plate in place. And there's no anti-reverse switch, just like on the Shimano. So it's very difficult for water to already make its way into the gearbox. I still think both are an exceptional way of physically sealing the reel to where water can't get into the main gear itself. But the entry points are really gonna be at that handle entry point that's going to be the main part where water can potentially ingress and get in there. And then as we kind of take a look at the Stratic and we take the spool off and take a look at how that is physically sealed, get this off. They do have the same plunger design as well. This one sits a little bit lower into the entry point for the drag stack. Um, that's nice. I don't know that it's going to make that much of a difference. It's not going to deter it any better or any worse. But once you take that spool off and you kind of see how they have this assembly done, they have that same type of lipped rubber seal. This one's orange in this case, protecting water working its way down the main shaft and into the main gear or into the anti-reverse clutch, forgive me. But it's the same type of sealing, again, to where it's providing physical protection, but it's not impeding the smoothness of that reel when that main shaft is traversing. Let's take a step further. Once water, or if water, although unlikely, makes its way down the main shaft, what's the first thing it's gonna make contact with? Well, it's gonna make contact with the anti-reverse clutch mechanism and bearing that's pretty much in the dead center of the reel. How both of these companies go about sealing this area is very different. There's a lot of jargon that, that Shimano uses in how they protect that anti-reverse clutch. And we've mentioned it before. Essentially, as you notice, there's no switch on the front here, right? So you can't back play these reels. Great for saltwater anglers that want to have the ultimate amount of protection, but this is an infinite anti-reverse. You can't switch it over and start turning your handle backwards. We don't necessarily need that here in the Southeast, but what Shimano's trying to do and what all these companies are trying to do is to protect that anti-reverse. The way Shimano does or goes about doing it you see here X Protect, and I don't know if it's listed on the other side. They also have Core Protect. Core Protect and X Protect are two separate things. Core Protect from Shimano is more of a hydrophobic coating around the area where if water were to make contact with it, there's this solution that helps water beat up and roll off the area when you turn the handle and there's rotation. That rotor and, and just that centrifugal force is gonna blow water away, so it's not gonna stand on the bearing itself. X-Protect is what's included on the Stratic and higher. It's a labyrinth. Water has to go over and down and under and in and up and over top. It's a physical labyrinth design to prevent water from getting into that anti-reverse clutch. I, I like it, I think it makes sense. It's gonna help prevent water from getting down in there. Diable goes about it a little bit differently. They look at things from physical means of compression and threaded plates. So there is a threaded piece that goes over top of the anti-reverse clutch and there is a rubber gasket that lines it. This starts happening in the MQ series of reels. This threaded cup that comes down with compression and that rubber seal even if water were to make its way up underneath that cup, it's gonna stop at that rubber seal and it's not gonna be able to get by. So in terms of sealing the anti-reverse clutch, both reels do it great, to be completely honest. They're both effective means of keeping water out of that anti-reverse clutch bearing area. So let's talk about line rollers for a second or, or, or line roller bearings. So backing up a good number of years, people that have been avid users of the Stratic, the CI4 Plus, the Stratic FK and older renditions, guys that love the Stratic, would complain that the roller bearing in the Stratic series would blow out. It would get raspy after a dozen trips out on the water. And the reason was the roller bearing that Shimano used was compromised from the elements. Water and salt got in there, started to wear away at that bearing. And you'd hear that when you're turning the handle, 90% of the time it's that roller bearing. From that point moving forward, I believe Shimano addressed how they do their line roller assembly but not necessarily replacing that bearing. They just made it a little bit easier for the consumer to access and maintain it themselves. Instead of having to take the entire assembly out, they now can piece this apart into seven, eight different pieces, access the bearing, and whether they wanna lubricate it or they wanna buy a whole bunch from Shimano, it's an easy piece that they can change out. Now, I believe the same also applies to the pen. I believe they also have a line roller bearing in here. It's There's not nearly as many pieces inside here, and these are, shielded bearings. They're not sealed bearings, so they still can be compromised. All of that being said, the big question is, is having a bearing in the line roller important? Well, I think people fishing up in the north, fishing for 
smallmouth bass with six and eight pound fluorocarbon line and they want that super fluid drag and everything going smoothly, I think it's important. But for guys that are using 10, 15, 20 pound braid on a rod and fighting big fish, whether you go with a bearing or you go with a bushing is irrelevant in terms of how it operates at the end of the day. As long as this piece here is spinning freely, I don't think that it makes much of a difference whether it's a bearing or a bushing. In my opinion, bushings are very easy to maintain. And I actually just recently maintained my uh, my BGMQ bush bushing. I've had these reels for over eight months, had a little bit of grime on it, took it apart in two minutes, gave it a quick dab of WD-40, or you can use Corrosion X or Cleanse Oil, and it's back to spinning freely so that my line doesn't twist when line is coming off of the spool. So really, really easy part to maintain. I think it's made out of some sort of Teflon or plastic, but it's gonna last forever. You're never gonna need to replace it as long as you just give it a quick drop of oil every once in a blue moon. You're not gonna have to worry about going back to the manufacturer and buying a bearing to change out if it were to get compromised. So that's really important to keep in mind when it comes to that location. All right, so back onto the topic of refinement and smoothness. And I think that the thing that helps bring all of this together and what makes these reels smooth is the gearing material and how the main gear and the pinion mesh together. So this is highly controversial. I think a lot of people will look at all the different reels out there, they'll spec it out. And one of the main questions that people are asking is, which reel has an aluminum main gear or a brass main gear or which companies or models are still using a zinc material in their main gear. So this is what I wanna dive into. Across the board, aluminum, yes, a CNC'd or cold pressed, whether it's Penn or Shimano, we'll talk about how they do it differently. Aluminum main gears are smooth, they're precise, and they're very lightweight and durable. In the long run, aluminum is a great material to use on a main gear. It's reliable for a long, long time. You'll have an uncompromising level of smoothness. There's not gonna be any burrs in the teeth, not gonna be any gaps or jumps or any play in the handle with an aluminum gear. And I think that people believe that a zinc material um, might have some imperfections, if you will, or there might be play, or from one teeth to the next, it might roll over and it might feel sloppy in the long run. I think in the yesteryear version of spinning reels, that might have been the case. I think historically there had been some challenges with the quality control of zinc material in the main gear, but long term, and from Daiwa's perspective in particular, Daiwa does a great job at how they align all their gears together, their main gear and their pinion. They call it their DigiGear or digital gearing system. And what they're essentially doing, what they've been doing with the BG and older, their DigiGear is bigger in diameter and in thickness, and they have deeper cut teeth. And the way they etch and cut these teeth and how it meshes with the pinion gear is very exact. So instead of just throwing a zinc main gear like any other company outside of these three would do, for example, they've taken a lot of time in refining how well they're making a zinc gear. And they're able to do that because I think that Daiwa's approach with a zinc gear, and in particular, the BGMQ, is different. So let's kind of, before we go into the nitty gritty here, let's explain. Both of these reels have an aluminum main gear. There's a CNC cut aluminum main gear here, and there's Shimano's fancy Hagane cold forged, black painted coated main gear. Very refined and smooth, but the question is, is this superior to this because this is aluminum and this is zinc? I don't think so, guys. I really don't think so in the long run. Daiwa does a great job of gearing. The main gear itself, the zinc main gear, is not what's wearing out on a reel long term after many fish caught. It's not the chipping or rolling or damage of the main gear. It is the support bearings. It's the main shaft. It's tolerances shifting and moving, not the integrity of the main gear itself. So how Daiwa goes about doing it and how Penn and Shimano go about doing it is very different. These companies right here, this is a traditional mindset. The main gear is approximately the size of like, let's say a silver dollar, okay, just, just for reference. And this main gear and the material that they're using is focused on smoothness. That's great, especially in the case of the Shimano that uses what they call micro module gearing. And essentially all they're doing is they're etching away more teeth in that main gear itself. Not necessarily any deeper, still the same size main gear, but there's more teeth, so there's more contact points more frequently where that main gear and that pinion meet up together. That in turn will result in 
smoothness. There's not going to be any play. There's, there's more points of contact as that gear and that pinion gear rotate and move with each other. There's going to be more points of contact in a micro module geared reel, starting with the Stratic and upward. The pen, there really isn't a level of refinement in the teeth. It's still a great gear, but it's just aluminum. I think the, the value of what's being added here in the main gear in the pen is that it is aluminum material. But when you come over to the BGMQ, you might not be getting aluminum main gear, but you're getting a gear that is 20% bigger in terms of overall size and thickness than its competitors in the market. And you have deeper cut teeth. So what that translates to is a bigger gear with deeper teeth when under a load will evenly distribute the pressure and allow for more strength when you're winching down or when you're reeling down on a fish. So technically in application, if you hook up with a big fish running towards structure or you know, big red on the open flats, People believe to use their rod to be able to fight fish and feather your drag. Yes, that's the way to approach it. But in those moments, when you're reeling down on some slack on a fish and you don't want to give it a lot of slack, while these two may feel very well refined, you can't argue that a bigger gear when under a load is going to be a more efficient tool at reeling that fish in and pulling it towards you. Yes, you're using the rod to pull the fish and provide all that power, but you don't want to reel down on a big fish and feel like your gear is straining. So that is a potential that could happen with a small traditional style gear, whether it's made out of zinc or aluminum or brass or stainless. The sizing and the, the methodology of Daiwa's means of cutting their gears is efficient. It's a powerhouse. That's its intended approach. I think they did a good job in that regard. I think these companies still do a great job in their gear, but... To settle the conversation, or I really leave it open, I'd actually like to hear from a lot of you guys. When it comes to materials of gear, zinc, aluminum, and so forth, one thinking that one is superior to the other, I think it's a matter of application. I think Daiwa offers a powerful gear that is well cut, and it's of good, it's of good design, even though it's zinc, compared to the aluminum counterparts that these other companies make. Par for the course, I'd say this in terms of power, I'd say this, I guess, in terms of long-term refinement, but really, I think it comes out to a wash at the end of the day. So to bring all of this to a close, guys, we want to kind of go through a quick pro and con about all three of these reels. Again, all great products, but if we're going to be unbiased in our approach, we want to address what are the good things about these reels, what do they do really well, what are some areas of improvement? So going right to left here, we're going to take a look at the Shimano Stratic. Again, Benchmark reel for Shimano. Everybody knows what the Stratic is. It's very smooth, okay? The pro is in the refinement. Shimano is known for their gearing. They, they have their micro module gearing system in the Stratic. Everything's in perfect alignment. It's very, very smooth. That is what the company is known for. So I think a lot of guys, when they grab a Stratic and they turn the handle, they go, man, that feels pretty smooth. That's hard to deny. And I will give remarks in a positive manner to the Shimano Stratic. It's a great design and this rendition is excellent. However, some areas of improvement that we've noticed and experienced in the long run are really in two areas. The first being, maybe it's a personal gripe, but the fact that they have not replaced that with a bushing and they're maintaining it with a bearing itself still means that there is a possibility that that bearing can fail. Regardless of the amount of grease or the apparatus that they use, I think they've made it easier for the consumer to maintain if that bearing does fail. They can go to Shimano, get a bunch of different bearings or bokeh bearings or whatever, and pop it in there and keep it running. But the fact that you have to maintain it, and it was a sticking point for a lot of you know uh, consumers in the past, um, that's more of an annoyance to me. I think it might be personal, but that's important to note, is that it's still a bearing, not a bushing that you know was going to last for the lifetime of the reel. And additionally, something unique that we found out, Tony is a huge fan on our team of the Shimano Stratic, and for good reason. It's a great reel. But one thing that he's noticed long-term after two years of use is that on both of his Stratics, he's mentioning that the drag feels a little sticky. Like when a fish goes to burn drag, it doesn't feel extremely fluid. Like it's a little choppy. And that could be, from my perspective, how they grease the stacked carbon fiber uh, uh, discs here on this drag system. Shimano has felt drags on the 2500 Stratic and smaller, but you jump up to carbon fiber when you go into this 3000 size. However, he's starting to say that with that stickiness, he's trying to figure out what it is, it's likely how these are greased, how fluid or how viscous that grease is. Long term, I think it might start to emulsify or take in 
dust or particulate matter that might affect the overall smoothness when this reel is under a load and when that drag is peeling. So that's something important to consider long term. Um, again, let us know down in the comments below if you've experienced that or not, but that is something that we've noticed over the past years of, uh, of hard use on this particular reel. So pro and con of the spin fisher itself, the pro very well sealed, almost more than any angler would really need. And for those that like to be able to maintain their gear, you can get in here, re-grease everything, re-oil your bearings. Um, some fishermen really like that that you know DIY aspect of the reels. Uh, but I'd say the con overall is just the weight it, and, and the kind of the refinement of the reel. It is still a smooth reel, and over time, I think it's probably going to wear in and get a little bit smoother after you use it and catch a bunch of fish. But right off the bat, it's the heaviest reel out of the bunch, and it's not going to feel nearly as refined or smooth, or it's not going to require such little effort to start up and turn that handle and get it going. Um, really, I don't know that this is the best choice for throwing light, small, soft plastics on the open flats for redfish and trout. Still can work, but I think that in that category, there are other products on the table that do that type of application better. So when it comes to the BGMQ pros and cons, I'd say that the biggest pro is after fishing with the Penn Spin Fisher and a lot of the feedback we've had from Tony on the Stratic, it's a good balance of refinement and sealing. There are nine internal seals all throughout the MQ reel. It has a monstrous main gear. So that main gear, like I said, is going to translate to all that power when you're under a load. Important to me if I'm fishing around docks or mangroves and I'm getting big snook. I liked having that, but I didn't want to sacrifice power or sealing with smoothness. I think that it kind of checked all of those boxes in that $200 category. But on the same token, I'd say that the con of this reel, and something that a lot of people have pointed out, is that the MQ series of reels by Daiwa are not easy to maintain on your own. So there are a lot of anglers out there, experienced anglers, who want to be able to pop this open, regrease the main gear, um, you know, get into the pinion and, and just change things out if needed. They want that access. And at the moment, there isn't the ability to do so. These reels would need to be sent back to an authorized Daiwa service center or to Daiwa itself directly. And you're really kind of at the mercy of Daiwa fixing it and getting it back to you. But the bigger question is, is that even necessary? If the reel is designed in a way to where it's well sealed and it's very smooth, we as fishermen, I mean, we all of us, we want a reel that is reliable long-term without needing to do a lot of maintenance. I really don't need to, but for one or two minutes, you know, maybe every once in a while, every six or eight months, do a quick drop of oil and clean out that bushing that's in the line roller. And currently, other than a quick freshwater rinse down, I've had this reel for eight months. I've caught a lot of big fish on it. I haven't needed to do a single thing on this reel. Some anglers like to maintain their reels every six months to a year seasonally. I think that if a reel is designed well enough, it doesn't need to be serviced. I think that, that kind of takes that out of the equation altogether. After all these pros and cons in consideration, I think a lot of you guys want to address which one is the best, which one is the winner. And to be truthful, at the end of the day, I can't say that one is truthfully the best. They're all great products. Some do things a little bit better than the others. I have really enjoyed using the BGMQ personally after using and hearing a lot of feedback on all three. So I have my personal inclination towards this reel, but I wanna hear from you guys as well. Which reel do you enjoy using? Have you had a great experience using the Stratic or the Spin Fisher or the MQ series of reels, whether it's the BGMQ or higher? Leave comments down below, guys. The way that we get better about sharing this information and helping anglers make a good purchasing decision is by sharing all of our collective experiences and moving forward from it. So thank you so much, guys, and I will see you on the water. If you're new to Salt Strong, just know we're the best inshore fishing club that teaches you how to catch more redfish, sea trout, snook, and flounder. You save a ton of money on your tackle, and you meet a lot of awesome new fishing friends. So to learn more, head over to saltstrong.com, and we will see you in the Insider Family soon.